Hello there, Minus here and this is how and why. Today we're going to explain how auroras work. I recently uploaded a video about optical phenomena, but I barely scratched the surface about auroras. So after your request, here it is. Auroras explained. The formation of the northern and southern lights begins with solar flares from the sun. Those flares eject groups of electrons from the sun that act as a wind and flow towards the Earth. When the solar wind of electrons reaches the planet, they first encounter Earth's magnetic field, referred to as the geomagnetic field. This will deflect the electrons, and with this deflection, the electrons move around the planet and hit near the polar regions where the magnetic field is weakest. That's how the daytime auroras occur when electrons hit the sun-facing magnetic field and are deflected to the poles. But the solar wind doesn't stop when it first encounters the planet. It will continue to move to the other side of the Earth, the side facing away from the sun, and reach the back side of our magnetic field. When it hits the back side of the Earth's magnetic field, electrons are again drawn in towards the poles, creating the nighttime auroras. All this activity is centered around the geomagnetic poles, which are about 10 degrees different in latitude than the regular north and south poles we think of. Views from space show the auroras as rings of light that are centered around the geomagnetic poles. From the planet's surface, this phenomenon appears as curtains of light due to the structure of the magnetic fields. The most common colors seen are green and blue. But the auroras can also show pink and orange hues depending on the altitude and the interactions of photons, which are particles of light. Views of the Earth's northern and southern lights show glowing sheets and rippling waves of bright light painting the sky in striking shades of green and even red, blue and purple. These breathtaking scenes are created as streams of energetic charged particles hit the upper layers of Earth's atmosphere of altitudes up to a few hundred of kilometers and interact with resident atoms and molecules of mostly oxygen and nitrogen. These emit photons at specific wavelengths of the visible spectrum, green and red for oxygen, blue and purple for nitrogen. Auroras also happen in other planets. Hubble Telescope has observed auroras on Jupiter and Uranus on various occasions. In 2011, when the telescope became the first to image the phenomenon from the vicinity of Earth, then again in 2012 and 2014, taking extra data beyond visible light. By pointing Hubble's ultraviolet eye on Jupiter twice during the same month, from 1st to 5th and 22nd to 24th of November 2014, scientists were able to determine that the planet's glimmering auroras rotate along with the planet. The observations helped also to locate the planet's magnetic poles and allowed scientists to track two so-called interplanetary shocks that propagated through the solar system. These shocks were triggered by two powerful bursts of material flung out by the sun via the solar wind. An ongoing flow of the charged particles constantly emanating from our star and caused the most intense auroras ever seen on Jupiter. This image, originally published in 2017 by NASA, shows the auroras as wispy patches of green against the planet's azure blue disk and combines optical and ultraviolet observations from Hubble with archived data from NASA's Voyager 2 probe. Now let's get back to the Earth auroras. The main entities responsible for the aurora are monatomic oxygen, diatomic nitrogen and ionized diatomic nitrogen. Oxygen emits either a red-orange or a lemon-green glow Nitrogen emits a deep red glow, while its ionized form emits a deep blue or a deep purple glow. As a rule, the colors are set and never change, but the three parameters stated above make the colors vary. Sometimes the color limits are quite defined, but most of the time the entities mix with current at different altitudes and create other colors like pink, yellow, emerald blue, magenta and purple. During periods of intense geomagnetic storms, you can potentially get a lot of different colors at once. It is also worth noting that there are other entities than monatomic oxygen and nitrogen at these altitudes. 
Among others, hydrogen, nitric oxide, and helium are present in the atmosphere. Nevertheless, their interaction with solar particles doesn't produce an auroral glow. Let's see closely the different colors. Pink Pink is usually the brightest and most vibrant color overall found at the base of an aurora. It occurs only when the aurora activity is very high, typically during substorms, displaying very bright bands at high geomagnetic latitudes, aka near the poles. When the solar particles have great speed and energy, they can penetrate the farthest down into the atmosphere up to mesosphere, which means 80 km of altitude. There they find bigger molecules to collide with, like diatomic nitrogen and positively charged particles of diatomic nitrogen. At this altitude, the air density is the highest in comparison to higher altitudes. Therefore, the particles are closer to one another and collide much more. Consequently, only the entities with an extremely short photon-emitting time can glow before other entities steal their surplus energy. Once hit by energetic electrons, ionized nitrogen molecules emit photons which wavelengths are in red, deep red. Our eyes and cameras do the additive color synthesis and interpret this mix of colors as a bright pink. Green between 250 and 100 km of altitude above the Earth's surface, only solar particles with moderate speed and energy can reach down. It's a zone where lots of entities mix, but the particular density generally allows only one species to dominate – monatomic oxygen. But why not diatomic oxygen? At these altitudes, strong UV radiations from the Sun tend to split diatomic oxygen into two atoms of oxygen during the day. Therefore. Oxygen exists in its monatomic form as well. Solar particles firstly hit diatomic nitrogen. The high energy level of the particles does two things. It not only ionizes nitrogen 2 into nitrogen 2 plus, but also causes a lower wavelength light, blue photon, as a side effect. The ionization makes diatomic nitrogen lose an electron. This electron shoots and bumps into a nearby oxygen atom with an energy level enough to excite them. To de-excite, the oxygen atom dissipates out a photon of visible light with a wavelength of about 550 nanometers, which corresponds to lemon green. Once again, our eyes and cameras do the additive color synthesis and interpret this mix of colors as a lime green. The chain reaction is very ubiquitous. It happens even during low solar input. This alone makes green the most friggin' color. It's extremely rare to have an aurora without green. Green is the color people usually have in mind when they think of auroras. Myself counted. Red Above 250 km of altitude, the entities are extremely isolated and the general density of the atmosphere is so low that particles rarely bump into each other anymore. We mostly find monatomic entities, including monatomic oxygen. Nitrogen is generally too heavy to exist by itself further up. Because of that, oxygen does not get bombarded by nitrogen electrons, but rather by solar wind ones. In turn, that produces another color. Some particles with a bit less energy hit monatomic oxygen and excite it. To de-excite this atom produces a photon of light in a wavelength of orange and red of the visible spectrum at 630 nanometers. During normal activity, the red glow is much fainter than green or pink. It's oftentimes very hard to observe the canopy if the observer stands right under the aurora. The bright green and pink have a tendency to outshine it. The best way to observe it is to be located away from the display or above it, like astronauts do. So this pretty much sums up how auroras are made. Let me know your thoughts about this. Have you ever experienced an aurora? Do you like them? Let me know your thoughts down into the comment section. If you like this content, you can like and subscribe to my channel and help me make it grow. Until then, see you next week. Bye.